Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, I have uh, an enormous amount of material to go through, so I'm going to go through it both very rapidly, but hopefully with enough depth that you'll have things to go back. And I apologize, but I don't have the auto-tweeter running with all of the back research materials sitting behind this, so uh, I will do that afterwards. So the title, of course, is First, Firster, and Firstest, uh, Three Lessons on History because I find that history is more and more important as we get into this information uh, revolution. And uh, just the other day, I found out about this from Simon Wardley, who said, well, there was a guy named Sivowich who came up with a law for what you're talking about, which says the first person is actually third. You just didn't realize it. Now, Sivowich, uh, next, please. Uh, Sivowich's law, can we advance the slides, please? Thank you. Um, it's really interesting because uh, it means that there's a lot that came before and typically the person who got credit for the idea actually was not the true inventor of that idea and that they built off of something and my premise is that a lot of times technology is catching up to the ideas rather than the other way around. And, uh, and so if we look at the past, we'll find interesting things like well-thought-out patterns. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it is, of course, one of the famous quotes, but also the fact that history uh, teaches us one lesson, and that's that we don't learn from history. So I'm going to start with one key premise uh, based on this, which is that the future of data, of this data today, is the relational database. But, of course, we can infinitely recur on that sentence right down to what the meaning of is is, but I won't go that far. We'll just talk about relational database. Now, the response to this is the conceptual framework is good. The specific implementation, maybe not so much. Now, what do I mean by that? Well. You know, the Swiss Army knife was a great idea when it cost 50 cents and fit in your pocket, but there is a point where suddenly it costs $5,000 and no longer fits in your pocket, number one. And number two, uh, through a lot of engineering and things, stuff happens. So why is the relational database such a problem for people today that they're saying we need to do other things? And, and th there's a number of reasons, but I'll pick on three because they're the three that recur throughout history going back thousands of years. One, single static schema model. Having a, a fixed model of where you stuff things into, which is very much like shelving library books or storing, storing scrolls at the Library of Alexandria. The second thing is rich typing system. Uh, the relational database or your oracles, they have timestamps and dates and integers and decimals. And, and when it comes to text, there's just some things that are arbitrarily long, and that's about the only interesting bit. And then everything else is a blob, and you don't know anything about it. Now, the third problem is the limited API. You have SQL. And SQL is great, except that it is artificially limiting in a number of important ways. And so those three things create the stressors, which creates the response. And the response is the SQL versus NoSQL debate. Now, with the SQL NoSQL debate, uh, what we're looking at is throwing everything out. We're taking the polar opposite. This doesn't work. It's sort of like saying, you missed dinner tonight, therefore you don't love me. So. I'm going to burn your house down. <laughs> and that is kind of what we have with the SQL no SQL debate in that it's not a debate or an argument, it's simply a contradiction. Now there's a difference in just taking the polar opposite of something because you're taking a set of assumptions, an engineered product and saying this other thing over here, this is gonna be completely different and so much better because it's the opposite. But for, there's a symmetry there because for every good thing you chose to invert, you turned it into a bad thing while simultaneously taking all the bad things and turning them into good things. But the problem is that you don't see the bad things that, or, or the good things that you're going to turn into bad things because they're invisible because they're a part of the franchise technology player. 
So uh, I, I love this quote from Beers because, uh, you know, basically there's lots of old stuff we don't know. The stuff that we don't know that I'm going to talk about to prove history's lesson is, is 500 years of information explosions. The fundamental data storage device for over a thousand years has been the book or the codex. Uh, obviously paper goes back a lot further, but I wasn't allowed to go that long. So we're going to talk about the first information explosion in sort of modern times with the, the written device, the Elizabethan era. So the Elizabethan information explosion, the Elizabethan sequel, no sequel debate. So what happened? Eight million books in 1500, 200 million books in 1600. That's a big increase. Um, that's a lot of data. That's the so first big exponential curve. Actually, it's the third, but you know, we won't go into that. And the other thing is commoditization of the parts of the machinery that generates the books, just like we commoditized technology to produce transaction processing systems. And there's all sorts of stuff that's invented during this era, so how do we manage that stuff? Well, Elizabethan era storage and retrieval, uh, as we move through it, is really involved with shelving books because books are the containers, they're the database of the day. And the way that you do it is you start to classify things. You build a schema. How do we store this stuff? So we start with the Vatican Library, which is huge, but back then it didn't really have that many books in it if we start at the very beginning. Um, and they, they started with, with a simple division of the world, sacred, profane, and then it all fell out underneath that. That's really trivial. And then along came bacon. But uh, n not that bacon, this, this other bacon, Francis Bacon, who said that, oh, we need a better division. So he came up with history, posy, and philosophy as the past, everything that is conceivable, and things that can re or do really exist. So Bacon starts to unravel things a little bit and extend the models and push things down and begins this sequel no sequel debate of his era. Um, then we come to the Georgian era, right? So we're at the end of that explosion and there's a new explosion, right? The Royal Society. The Royal Society came up, uh, you know, developed, you know, Wilkins, Newton, all these wonderful people. And the big explosion in Europe at that time during the Georgian era was the beginnings of science, because Bacon really started the whole scientific revolution in thinking and recording. And, and, and of course, we also had another thing, sharing. People are writing things into books so that they may have discussions with their counterparts in very distant lands and discuss these things. And you have to have a common language, a common taxonomy. How do you know that that octopus is the same octopus that I'm talking about? And so, uh, this explosion of knowledge creates even more books and we end up with a debate and the first really big debate here is is a guy named Buffon whom nobody's heard of. He comes up with a method that says well things are different. I don't believe in the fixity of species because that was a big religious thing. God created the animals, there they are. Uh. But they weren't really, they change, they, they vary. A population might be white in the snowy area and dark in another area. It might be big down in the valley floor and small up in the mountains. And he constructed a classification scheme that would allow for the adjustment of that because his species designator, his tree of life, included behavior, it included environment, it included other attributes besides just morphology, faceted classification. Meanwhile, um, meanwhile, Linnaeus had a different structure. He was an essentialist. He said, oh, well, Essentially, a deer is this thing, and, and it has a few features, and they narrow down the things that make the thingness of a thing. And it's top-down. It's statically defined. It's a taxonomy. It's a schema. It's just like a database schema. You have a database schema. You put data into it. What happens when something doesn't fit into the schema is the interesting part of this, because then you have to change it. You have to add a table. You have to add a branch in the taxonomy, giving you a place to stuff a bunch of new leaf nodes. So he had taxonomic classification, tree structure. And then we end up with a big debate of the day, uh, which, which was, uh, interestingly, you know, these two very different things, and they're sort of competing. Now, they didn't really butt heads a lot, but it was the theory of American degeneracy, which I just love because it almost seems relevant today. And the, the theory of American degeneracy was really, he, he was talking about how things um, in the new world 
were obviously smaller and uh, degenerate forms of the things that came from the old world, which is an interesting theory because the new world being new, we have deer versus the stag and quail versus the pheasant and obviously all these little Indians running around versus us big tall people from London. So they have their debate. Um, Thomas Jefferson is affronted by this and he is a natural philosopher and so he sends a moose Unfortunately not that kind of moose. He sends one of these and in Paris uh, they, they see this moose and he says Degenerate that now Buffon says well gosh, maybe I was wrong and TKO on we go To the Victorian era now the Victorian era what's interesting is we're still talking about shelving books and library signs and things like that How do you do this? Well a classification scheme you put stuff into the classification scheme, but the library indexing systems of the day dealt with smaller numbers of books. Now we're talking steam-driven printing. We're talking millions upon millions of books being generated annually. And so suddenly we've got a new problem, which is, you know, how do you index this stuff? And the way that they stored it oftentimes was, was well, not often, always variable library to library. They shelved them aesthetically. The small books here, the big books there. Let's do it by color. So along comes... Cutter and Dewey, and Cutter's expansive classification system, which is a, a component of the Library of Congress and academic library systems today. Faceted, bottom up. We don't know everything, we just know what's in the library, which is very different from I will classify all knowledge into a taxonomy and then shove it in there a la Linnaeus. Dewey, on the other hand, with the Dewey Decimal System says, I will classify all knowledge and create a static structure, a schema, a table in which to store things. So descriptive rather than explanatory, whereas the faceted stuff is explanatory rather than description. It's starting to sound a lot like tags and taxonomies and folksonomies and stuff. And of course, Dewey wins. SQL reigns supreme. So we move ahead and what we discover in these, these trade-offs is that every technology makes trade-offs. You take something out of the bag, you put something into the bag. Every time you make a choice, the opposite of that choice still exists out there as a possibility of something you might have done, which might have some negative consequences. So why did these guys win? Well, first of all, pragmatism. Good enough wins the day. Good enough means that it fit the purpose at the time. It may not fit the purpose 200 years from there, which is a problem with the Linnaean system today in biology, but we've lived with it for a very long time. With the Dewey system, it wasn't solving the problem you thought it was. It wasn't solving how do I find books on a shelf because in fact the Dewey numbering system points to a shelf and you hunt for your book. It's like the 64 megabyte blob of data that lands on HDFS that you fetch in to sift through to find the thing that you're looking for in that big blob of stuff. That's the shelf. He was solving the data ingest problem. How do I write data fast enough? How do I shelve books fast enough that the librarians can get the damn books in there? And that was the problem. So what lesson might we apply from this? Perhaps you should think about pragmatism is probably a key element and perhaps you should look at the things that the other part does well that you don't think are important because maybe they are or will be just down the road. So, that brings us into the industrial age to dealing with data in the industrial era. And, you know, the thing is, a book is like a 64 megabyte chunk of data. There's a whole lot of stuff in the book. So along comes somebody you've never heard of, Paul Oatley in Belgium, of all places. Um, if you know, that's actually a swear word. And he, he creates something. It's called the mundanium. And in the mundanium, he says, well, books are components. Let's spine the books, take the pages out, and index the pages. So th this, is the, this is the data ingest mechanism where they can spine and, and ingest things in parallel. They can write it by putting it onto three by five cards and invention of the day, shove it into the system, and then later it's stored millions upon millions of these things. This actually existed and ran as a going concern for quite a while. Um, you send him 27 francs, he sends you a thousand index cards with the answers that you were looking up. So, and it retrieves in parallel. You notice the multiple read heads there. Um, 
He invented all of this stuff from the 1890s and, and concluded his career roughly in 1934 when he published this book where he provided a future vision. And the future vision includes everything you think of as a computer today. He was before Vannevar Bush. He was before Ted Nelson. He had the complete vision, not a computer, not the internet, but the entire thing, all the way down to the taxonomies, faceted search. He invented page rank because he said the things that point to a particular object that other people follow is probably going to help choose which of these books and which of these pages is the right one for you for that same question. But it was static and top down and eventually it collapsed under its own weight. So information management throughout history, technology developments, create new methods to cope, create information scale and availability. First we capture and record, then we have a problem, and then we end up with big data. From there, yes, so, so um, really big data we talk about now is a separation of things. It's unstructured data. It's this stuff over here. It's that, that data over there and the tabular thing. Well, I can stay in the database, but this stuff over here. Well, the problem is that it's just unmodeled. It has deep structure. And so what we're really trying to do is put that stuff into something. So when I say the future of data is the relational database and the NoSQL world is the paradise and the hell on earth is the SQL, that is at many people's experience, but there's a second part, which is that it can be the inverse and in fact it's both because that is an artificial dichotomy. You have facets, tags, folksonomies, you have uh, the strictures of, of the schema on the other side. The false dichotomy that has existed throughout history of SQL, no SQL, of taxonomy, ontology, of, of structure, of discoverable structure versus imposed structure, pre-modeling versus post-modeling, can be removed by technology, and these things do not have to be separate, because code defines what is possible. So the real conclusion to learn from this cycling of things is that if you procrastinate long enough, most problems will in fact solve themselves because somebody will invent that technology. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs>